Frailty is a state of vulnerability to stressors. The aim of our Center of Research Excellence is to, tr to create the evidence that would be of benefit to Australia in the first instance. Uh, we would like to create new models of care, change practice so that older Australians can live with independence for longer. And the way to do that, we know, is by better tackling frailty, which is actually a hidden issue amongst our community at the moment. Um, so a lot of the work we have been doing thus far within the CRE is to create evidence to help change practice and change policy so that there can be new treatment options to prevent and better man manage frailty. And what we know from our Australian research is that one in four older people over the age of 80 years can be affected by frailty. I'm, I'm quite pleased that the, um, the uh, CRE frailty and healthy aging is actually looking at these issues in particular, trying to understand and dissect the issues so that we can better understand this a little bit more and how we can actually help someone better and to remain, to, to keep them independent at home. And it is a, a very complex process of which it affects individually quite significantly. Uh, it's not just a um, physical part of it, but there's also a lot of emotional and social impact uh, as a result of uh, being frail. So we know that, um, that ageing is something that happens to everyone and, and that can't be avoided, but there are different ways that people age. So some people of the same age can be quite different in, their, in the way they present physically and functionally. And so we can attribute some of that to frailty and, and frailty is something that we can either reverse or delay or prevent or at least slow its progression. So we've identified that um, approximately 20% of older adults age 65 and above are frail and that it's more common in women and also more common as people get older. Frailty is not always a downward spiral, it's a dynamic condition where um, people can improve. So over the last five years, as a, as a researcher, as a health researcher and as a GP, I've increasingly realised that you can intervene with people who have early frailty. Not everybody who ages will get frail, bedridden, not able to walk. What we now need to do is reverse how we work with people as they begin to age. It's not far from being taking a common sense. Um, and we all know that to stay healthy, uh, you need to eat well, you need to sleep well, uh, you need to exercise, you need to keep yourself physically active. And it's actually as simple as that. There's also other ways of, of trying to uh, reverse frailty that don't involve necessarily doing exercise. So being socially active, attending groups or doing activities that have a similar effect to exercise, such as gardening or dancing or walking around shops, uh, can also have that same, same benefit. But also um, we know that by being socially engaged um, and having that mental stimulation of interacting with other people, that has a, a, just a general effect on, on people's health and well-being as well. And staying connected uh, to the community, staying connected with family, staying connected with friends, I think is really one of the key elements to prevent frailty. If I had one key take home message to uh, give us, it is the fact that frailty is something that we can actually treat. It is actually something that we can prevent. And we can do so by using really simple measures such as observing uh, good physical activity across the lifespan and eating healthily. The idea of simple, uncomplicated interventions such as exercise, good nutrition, good supports at home, safety at home, but 
taking the medications they don't need off is actually so logical for me as a GP. I'm looking forward to looking how we might roll that out into the future. It's an incredibly positive way of looking at frailty and ageing, which is about value adding, reversing it. And again, as a GP, nearly a quarter of the patients who we identify with frail, we can reverse. And it just sets a different tone for the future as we move forward. Physical activity across the lifespan is key to longevity and to do that with healthy longevity. However, it is even better if we have adequate protein intake because protein is a key building block for muscles. I think the choice of food has become increasingly important. Um, and one of the things about eating as you get older is, is actually looking for a protein-rich diet. Um, and I don't think that we, we all know that very well, um, but it is important. Now, the resources of which you can look for those things, um, apart from speaking to a dietitian, is actually online. A lot of them has a very good um, uh, resource for which you can look for a protein-rich diet. Um, so proteins is an important part when you think about the choice of the diet. Because frailty is dynamic, we know that regular review is important. And in those reviews, um, it's an opportunity to pick up on what might have changed over time, but also to plan interventions to address some of those changes that have happened to people to, to try and reverse or delay frailty. Also, um, having a medication review is important to make sure that there aren't multiple medications interacting with each other, along with um, increasing vitamin D levels. One of the areas that we've been developing is screening tools. So we now know there are a set of practical, logical screening tools that can fit into Australian general practice. We've now defined them quite clearly, and I look forward to seeing how they roll out within some of the structures we have. For example, the 75th Health Plus Assessment is an ideal place to add a, screen, a frailty screening tool into the normal everyday processes. Having done that screening with the tools that we will use in general practice, which the practice nurses can use or other allied health staff, and you identify with people with frailty, what I would want to do then is develop a full whole of person approach. Nutrition, exercise, quality of life measures, look at their moods and if they're depressed, but probably most importantly is to look at their prescriptions. A lot of the work that I'm beginning to see and happen in general practice is about what we call de-prescribing. In other words, stopping, stopping drugs you don't need anymore because they're not actually giving you quality of life. As people tend to live longer these days and get older, they're more likely to develop frailty and more likely to develop multiple medical conditions for which they may be prescribed multiple medicines. Um, thinking back 20 years ago, on average, a hospitalized adult would use about six medicines and this number has now increased till about 11. Medicines are really important, especially in older people, they use to hold disease progression and control symptoms. We do know though that the more medicines that people are taking, the higher the risk of any adverse um, outcomes associated with these medicines and then that can include drug um, adverse effects, drug-drug interactions, drug-disease interactions, falls, cognitive impairment, and even hospitalization and death. So we need to, um, when we're reviewing medicines, we need to continuously um, assess the net benefits of medicines and asking ourselves whether these medicines still um, meet our goals of care. Deprescribing is the process of withdrawing of potentially inappropriate medicines under the supervision of a health professional, really with the aim to reduce number of medicines and to improve outcomes. So when we're reviewing medicines, we need to consider opportunities for deprescribing of medicines that we no longer need and act on them where appropriate. So how do we get the right information to these patients in a way that they can not only understand it, but they can use it uh, and actually get real changes, real behavioural changes that will positively impact on their journey and the outcome. Rather than having the focus on, on the negative of, of these are the problems that are wrong with you, um, flipping that over to say, these are the capacities that you can achieve and there's ways of achieving those.
So in the CRE we uh, were looking, we're interested in um, older adults' perceptions and experiences of frailty. So uh, as a starting point we just wanted to know what people think about this word frailty. Does it, does it uh, has it have any special connotations for them? Is it something that a concept that they would find useful in a primary care encounter with their, their GP? Uh, we're also interested in if we were to introduce a screening pathway into general practice, uh, what, a, what an older person would think about that, that option. Would they see it as relevant to them? Would it be helpful? Uh, unsurprisingly, I think we found that frailty was often seen as a very, very negative term. Seeing frailty as an inevitable or unavoidable aspect of getting older. So in that sense, it was seen as something that was um, predetermined, fixed, there's nothing you can do about it. And as you can imagine, that's quite a, uh, a harmful or a, a, an unhelpful way of thinking if we're trying to change attitudes towards um, what is possible as you reach later life or what is possible in terms of reversing that frailty trajectory and getting back uh, to a state of a bit more uh, independence and function and all really about quality of life. Uh, we thought it was really important to uh, produce uh, a response to that that was addressing uh, misconceptions about frailty and just generally raising public awareness about what this yeah. clinical condition is. When it comes to frailty, the best strategy is to tackle it head on. We should be proactive in our approach, not reactive. What I mean there is we should look for it, we should identify if people are at risk, and then what needs to happen from there is a comprehensive assessment. Because through a comprehensive assessment, we can identify factors that can be improved on, and these factors might be internal to the person or in their environment. As a health geographer, I'm interested in the size distribution and dynamics of the older and frail population in Australia and also how the local area can influence um, our opportunity to age well. So from our research we've found that um, the people of a lower socio-economic background are more likely to be frail, so that includes people of a lower income level um, and lower education level and so that's that's common across a range of health conditions, but it also reflects in our findings on, on frailty. So understanding those factors of the environment that can contribute to um, helping us age well and maintaining our independence um, is increasingly important. We've noticed that through our research that things like access to parks can influence people's ability to stay active and remain health, you know, healthy in terms of their physical abilities. Obviously access to hospitals um, and GPs are important in terms of primary health care. So one of the projects I've been involved with is producing a frailty web map and um, this has shown that uh, the incidence of frailty is increasing rapidly in Australia. So the frailty web map builds upon other research that's been done within the CRE. So we've taken Australian frailty prevalence rates and applied them to the Australian census population. So we've got census population from 2011 and 2016, and we've also been able to get population projections to 2027. So we can um, look forward and see how we expect areas to change in terms of their frailty prevalence. So the frailty web map has really highlighted um, the, the growing incidence of frailty in Australia and how we expect it to change geographically over time. This can help us identify areas that we can target for services and also for interventions. Because these areas aren't um, currently equipped with um, enough services to support those populations, these, um, the web map can highlight areas of service need, which hopefully can prevent service shortages in the future. More than half a million people are expected to be frail by 2027 unless we act now. Um, the distribution is changing, which has implications for um, funding and um, the allocation of services. And I think um, taking a community public health level approach has real benefits in terms of it. We can do things to benefit whole communities through this area of research. So we know that um, by reversing frailty, um, that can have a, a positive flow on effect in terms of people's independence and function. 
And because of some of this research, I think then the government is starting to change the way we approach some of the healthcare system. So I think that's that's really exciting. So as a geriatrician, for me that's 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 good, that's excellent because you know previously no one looks at it, previously everyone ignored it, previously no one understands it. But I think now there's a lot more understanding, there's a lot more interest. We have to look at aged care differently. It's about a whole of person approach. And if the focus is on frailty as a way in or a tool to understand that better, I'm just excited by what this research and this research team has developed over the last five years. It's an excellent piece of work and will give us a future to move forward with in tackling this increasingly important problem.